Coming up. 2016 is hot, hot, hot. Boeing has acquired seats on Soyuz. And I interviewed Dennis Wingo about going back to the moon correctly this time. That and more coming up on this episode of Tomorrow. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? And welcome to Tomorrow Orbit 10, Episode 3. We are so glad to have you here today. Now, before we get started with our show, which we have a very interesting show today, we would like to thank all of our patrons of the Escape Velocity variety. These folks have given us $10 or more per episode, and they get access to things like our Slack channel, where you can actually interact with me and Dutta and Ben and Space Mike and everybody else directly. So... If you would like to help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, consider heading on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And I am your host today, Jared Head, while we've also got Space Mike next to me. And then over on this side, I got Dutta in here with everybody. Dutta on camera once and for all. Oh my gosh, it's just such an exciting day. And we're going to go ahead and get started with space news because, oh boy, we have got a lot to cover. And Space Mike, we're going to start with you because not only do we have a lot of launches... We have a whole load of launches. It's just, it's more than a lot. <laughs> it's a load of launches. Yes. And uh, we're going to start off with one that actually happened last Saturday. And this was right before uh, episode two. Uh, this was just a couple of minutes before episode two started. And we uh, held off uh, last week of broadcasting so that we could enjoy watching this live. But uh, what I'm talking about is, of course, uh, SpaceX's return to flight with their Falcon 9. So let's check out the launch footage from that successful Six, launch. Five. Three, two, one. Lift off, about the nine. Drop KVIRC and GNC and proceed to procedure 3.170 for post Now, as I said, this launch occurred last Saturday, that was January 14th, at 1754 Coordinated Universal Time from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And not only were they able to successfully do this launch, but they were able to also successfully land the first stage booster of the Falcon 9. And they landed that booster on their uh, automated drone ship, Just Read the Instructions. (laughs) And this was the first landing that they were able to, to successfully do in the Pacific Ocean and on that particular drone. Ship. And this was the seventh successful landing at sea, or rather the seventh landing total and the sixth successful landing at sea. And just amazing footage to see all the way down to the drone ship. Sounds like everybody got excited. Oh, yeah. Other than just a little bit of latency at the end, we were able to see the the view all the way down to the end. So that's just amazing that we were able to get that footage. So kudos to everyone involved who was able to to broadcast that live and show that to the world. And for this whole mission, in any case, uh, the payload for this mission was 10 next generation satellites for Iridium, their communication satellites, to send uh, voice and data um, as in a relay network in a polar orbit. And uh, these satellites are actually in a 625 kilometer orbit, or uh, for those of you in the United States, that's 388 miles. And uh, we were unable to see footage of them being deployed from the upper stage of the Falcon 9 because uh, they were didn't have signal. They, they, they lost telemetry for a little while. But once they regained telemetry, all nine, or excuse me, all 10 satellites had been confirmed, successfully deployed, and were healthy and operational. And both Iridium, the uh, customer, and uh, Tails Alenia Space, the uh, manufacturer of these satellites, have, have confirmed that they're in good condition. So congratulations to SpaceX for that successful return to flight. And I'm very excited for the future yeah. and uh, all the launches that they'll hopefully accomplish this year. Yeah, that was fantastic. I was watching it in my hotel room um, with a bunch of my friends around me and it was just so great with the footage coming back from the <laughs> ship like that. So fantastic. And uh, some bad news with the rocket launch as well. 
Mike. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this was a uh, experimental test. So uh, um, given that it was an experimental test, I guess it's uh, uh, there's not as much writing on it. But what we're talking about is a Japanese experimental rocket flight with a uh, sounding rocket that had an upgraded third stage uh, to try to get a three-unit cube set all the way into orbit. So uh, let's check out the footage that they have from this, and then we'll discuss why this failed. So with this, the first stage was only going planned to burn for about 30 seconds. Uh, it's an all-solid rocket uh, uh, stage. And they lost telemetry during those first 30 seconds when the first stage was burning. And the command to uh, separate and ignite the second stage was never issued. So it uh, fell harmlessly into the Pacific Ocean, but uh, it unfortunately was not able to deliver its payload into orbit. And if it had delivered its payload into orbit, it would have been the smallest orbital rocket launch that had ever been conducted by Japan or anyone else in the world. Um, so this was definitely a, a, a neat idea for having a small uh, uh, CubeSat-sized launcher. And in just a moment, you're going to get a good idea for a scale of what this was like. The three-unit CubeSat uh, integrated into the kind of payload adapter of its uh, upper stage next to uh, uh, one of the engineers who were building this is... Uh, uh, just a, a really uh, in, insane to, to think about how small this thing is and if it had actually been uh, successful. I don't know if we're having any uh, latency on the video, but there was one uh, last picture there that I was talking about that uh, unfortunately weren't able to see. Sorry about that. But uh, it was very small and, it, and uh, just not even like a half a meter around uh, in diameter. So oh. uh, unfortunately that wasn't able to happen, but this was just a small sounding rocket test. And it's unknown at this point if uh, uh, JAXA is going to try another attempt of an orbital launch like this, but uh, uh, it's kind of similar to several other developments that are going on, uh, around as well, kind of like the University of Hawaii's uh, Super Strippy rocket that uh, failed last year as well. So um, it's interesting that those haven't been able to work, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to do more stuff like that in the future. Yeah. And then we've got another successful launch uh, from the United States as well this week. Yeah, this was just uh, just occurred last night, and it uh, kind of depends on, on where you are in the time zone. So uh, in, in the United States, it, it launched at 7.42 Eastern time, but in, uh, and that was uh, yesterday on Friday, January 20th. But in coordinated universal time, it happened at 0.42 and on Saturday, today, Jan uh, January 21st. So let's check out the launch footage from that. Three, two, one, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance. States Air Force. Now, unlike the launch that uh, SpaceX did from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, this occurred from uh, Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. And the payload for this, as she said, was the SIBRS uh, um, uh, GeoFlight 3, the Space Based Infrared System Geosynchronous Earth Orbit Satellite. And what these satellites do is they use uh, the, the infrared uh, wavelength uh, to use pr primarily for missile warning and missile defense. And uh, there's a couple other uh, uses that these have that are kind of classified, so we won't uh, get into that, not that we know what those classified information is, but <laughs> they also say that they're used for battle space characterization and also enhanced intelligence about missile specifications, so they might be able to identify uh, to a better quality what missiles are actually being launched, you know, even if they're orbital missiles there. So uh, this was a successful launch, and uh, the satellite was able to be put into its transfer orbit to eventually use its own fuel and thrusters to uh, uh, get all the way into geosynchronous orbit. And it's actually joining the fleet of other satellites. This is the third flight of, of this particular spacecraft in, in a series. But there's other uh, spacecraft that the United States Air Force has that it's going to be joining so that they'll be able to have uh, continuous uh, views and monitoring over the entire Earth uh, for any sort of missile warning. So uh, congratulations to United Launch Alliance for their first successful launch of the year. And uh, hopefully we get to see a lot more launches uh, from uh, both of these companies and 
from the United States and everyone else in the world as well. Yeah, maybe we'll top the list for launches this year, uh, depending upon mm. what ends up happening. So that would be pretty cool. That would cool. be great. Now, uh, we're going <laughs> to get into the news in Space Mike. We're going to start off with some sad news that uh, happened a little bit earlier this week, but um, definitely a, a recognition, if you will, of a great man who unfortunately Absolutely. passed away this week. Absolutely. And uh, we're talking, of course, about Gene Cernan, who passed away on Monday. Um, he was 82 years old, and NASA announced it on their website, saying that he was uh, surrounded by family. Now, uh, he was born in uh, um, 1934, and he was a test pilot, or rather uh, a uh, Air Force, uh, excuse me, a jet fighter pilot in the Navy. And he logged more than 5,000 hours uh, in uh, air, uh, jet aircraft, and also completed more than 200 uh, air aircraft carrier landings at sea. Now, he was in the picture you see there, he is on the uh, uh, front row, second on, on the right, and he uh, was selected to be an astronaut for NASA in the third uh, group of astronauts uh, selected in 1963. Now, his first space mission was uh, as the pilot of Gemini 9, and uh, he was, uh, with that mission, he was joined by Thomas Stafford, and that occurred in 1966. And the image you see there is his uh, spacewalk that he did, and he was actually the second, the only the second American at the time to uh, do an EVA in space, and uh, he uh, spent actually more than two hours in space, and I'm sure that must have been a very, very enjoyable time for him. He said that the view, of course, was uh, life-changing. And, you know, like many astronauts talked about how that was a, definitely a perspective-changing view. And uh, his second space flight, though, was as the lunar model module pilot on Apollo 10, which was the uh, full dress rehearsal minus the actual landing uh, back in May of 1969. But his final mission was in December of 1972 on Apollo 17 as the commander. And that was the last human moon landing. And he was the last man to walk on the moon for that. And it's just uh, amazing the, the amount of, of missions that he was able to do, but also the the way that he talked about his experiences, and especially afterward in a lot of his uh, outreach and, and trying to inspire the public, um, something that he said a lot was that he did not want to have the responsibility of being the last man on earth. And something that I just wanted to share with you guys that really touched me was something that one of our own, Lisa Stojanovsky, she met Gene Cernan at an event to uh, uh, promote a new documentary uh, based on a, uh, his autobiography, The Last Man on the Moon. And just it <laughs> just uh, really touches me to see that photo. And I just wanted to quote his exact words of how he feels about his responsibility. He said that too many years have passed for me to still be the last man to have left his footprints on the moon. I believe with all my heart that somewhere out there is a young boy or girl with indomitable will and courage who will, f will lift that dubious distinction from my shoulders and take us back to where we belong. Let us give that dream a chance. So from all of us here tomorrow, we just definitely wanted to pay our respects and our tribute to Gene Cernan. And what an amazing life that he lived. And I'm very grateful for the amount of support and, and outreach that he gave for the entire space, space program. So, Yeah, just a fantastic <laughs> man all around. And uh, Absolutely. Really one of those, old, an astronaut's astronaut is kind of how I would describe him. He was fantastic in every role that he played during the space program. Absolutely. All right. And now that we're back, we're going to continue the news where I'm going to talk a little bit about 2016 because it turns out 2016 ended up being the hottest year on record and in fact <laughs> kind of blew away all the okay. records according to independent studies by NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, all both confirming independently that 2016 was the hottest year on record. Now, the previous hottest year on record was 2015, and if you'd like to get an idea of just how hot 2016 was, that red line that is significantly higher than all of the other lines there, that is 2016 itself. So significantly hotter. It was 0.99 degrees Celsius warmer than the mid-20th century average, and since accurate records have began in 1880, the 16 warmest years on record have occurred since 2001. So in other words, the past 16 years have been the 16 warmest years on record. So in case you wanted to know, 
uh, any confirmation that a climactic change is occurring, well, here you go. Here's your pretty solid evidence. It's a little difficult to uh, refute with that there. So, yeah. Mike, going over to you because there is some good news um, as we started off our news with some bad news for both uh, people and the Earth. Uh, let's hear a little bit about what Boeing has up their sleeve, apparently. Yeah, and what this is with Boeing is this has to do with Sea Launch. This is the company that uh, does the launches from sea that experienced financial problems and went into bankruptcy several years ago. Now, Boeing owns a part of of Sea Launch. They own they are part of the shareholders of that, and so is RCS Energia in Russia. Now. Energia has tried to sell the, the uh, sea launch to uh, a Russian airline. We actually announced that story back in uh, September of last year. On, on the, actually, when I visited there and actually was in the studio. Now, before that, be- that deal was able to go through, and this new Russian airline owns Sea Launch, uh, they have to first settle with Boeing, who won in an international court that they get more than three hundred million dollars that needs to be paid to them before uh, the company can be sold. Uh, sea Launch can be sold. So. Uh, Actually, what has happened uh, in, in the recent developments is that Boeing and Energia have been talking uh, uh, out of court and have come up with a deal. And all of this kind of surrounds around uh, the Soyuz flights. Now, uh, Energia also announced a, um, a while back, or, or rather Roscosmos announced, that they're going to be lowering their crews on the Russian segment of the International Space Station from two members to three crew members, or rather from three crew members to two crew members. And that's going to free up extra seats on some future flights. And what Energia has offered is to give those future flights to Boeing. In fact, there's going to be five seats in total, and not all at the same same time, you know, one at a time. But Boeing has turned around and they like this deal apparently and they have uh, agreed to take those seats and they're trying to solic- solicit those seats on this, the crowed Soyuz vehicle to NASA and especially as a buffer in case there's any more delays with the commercial crew program which Boeing is a part of. And so far NASA has expressed interest in at least two of those seats to uh, have American astronauts uh, be sent up to the International Space Station and until Boeing's Starliner comes online and SpaceX's uh, Crew Dragon comes online, uh, we might be able to use all five of those uh, flights in order to keep the International Space Station continually inhabited by astronauts and cosmonauts from all over the world. So uh, I really like this, that uh, Boeing is, you know, first off took this deal in the first place to kind of get their compensation for what they uh, um, own in sea launch and to also turn around and, you know, I mean, they're selling it to NASA, so they're still making (laughs) some money off of that. They're still making their money back one way or another, but I really like that this is just, you know, another just-in case because the deadline for NASA to order more uh, seats from Russia to fly American astronauts has already expired, so we can't even order any more Soyuz flights from Russia unless they make a special exception for us, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, if things got drastic, they'd be willing to negotiate some sort of deal, but here's an opportunity that's already presented itself, and, you know, right Right on to Boeing for uh, yeah. making this possible. Yeah, very nice of them in order to do that and to uh, make it end up happening. So, all right, everybody, I want to alert you to something, something that's going to be happening in five years from now, um, which is that there are two stars that are likely going to collide in 2022. Now, this occurs in the galaxy on average about once every 10,000 years, and these findings were presented at the 229th meeting of the American Astronomical Society by Professor Lawrence Molnar of Calvin College. Now these stars are in the constellation Cygnus and what that means is that if you are in the southern hemisphere, very sorry, you will not be able to see uh, these stars collide. Now this binary is known as KIC 9 Eight three two 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 seven sounds like a nice place to visit. Oh, great and name! It's a contact binary, which means that the two stars' atmospheres are actually interacting with each other, and they're in contact with each other. Um, so, uh, these two stars. This is actually what they would look like if you could go out and see the stars, where there's just two of them touching. Now, they are slowing down as they orbit around each other, and they're eventually going to collide in 2022. Now, this will make a nova that will likely be bright enough to be seen with the naked eye. So, if this holds true, this will be the first accurate prediction of a nova event in the history of astronomy. So, a lot of people are very, very excited about this. And uh, I know I'm very excited about this, and I will definitely have my telescope ready to go um, to try to image so, it. 
So, like, will we be able to see this will the, with the naked eye, or will we need to have telescopes, or or will we even be able to see it with binoculars? Like, um, how how well will we be able to see it from where we are? From what we understand here in the northern hemisphere, you should be able to see it with the naked eye, assuming that you're at the right time of the year with Cygnus to be uh, out at night, because Cygnus is very close to the ecliptic. Um, which is the path that the sun travels through the sky. So that means during certain times of the year, the sun is up in the sky and Cygnus will be up in the sky with the sun. So you really won't be able to see it very easily. So typically here in uh, um, uh, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, you have to wait for the right time of year in order to see Cygnus. Um, but you will be able to, it is predicted to be able to see naked eye. And I've even heard very optimistic predictions that it could potentially be bright enough to be seen during the daytime. But oh, wow. those are very optimistic predictions based upon a very energetic collision between the stars. Um, we frankly don't know how energetic the collision will be. We just know that in times where we've actually seen stars collide with each other, um, which we actually saw a contact binary do that back in 2008. Um, it was bright enough that it did brighten those stars to the naked eye visibility. So uh, we'll have to see what happens with this one. Again, we're five years away from it happening, so anything could happen between now and then. It's just very interesting that we're making a prediction about it uh, so far out during an event that usually we don't predict. Usually Nova uh, or Nova just happen and then we just happen so to see is there is, is there actually like a chance that it could happen like any time between now and then um the original prediction was 2018 and then they pushed it back to 2020 and then they pushed it back to 2022 based upon better mm. and better data so as far as i'm concerned any time between now and 2022 it could potentially go but if it does i'll make sure to let everybody know on the show so that way you can go out and take a look at it assuming that it's bright enough to actually be able to see and, so, and I'm sorry, one more question. If it, sure. if, how long have they predicted that it might last for? Like, is it only going to be visible for like, uh, you know, one night, a couple of days or? Well, the Novae you know. that happened back in 2008 was visible for two and a half months. So uh, hopefully we can could potentially last something that long. Like that. It really all depends on what ends up happening. With Novae, they, you, it sounds like they're just predicting it to happen. They don't actually know how bright or how long it'll be visible for. So it could be super bright and visible for just a couple of days or bright enough to see and visible for a couple of months. So we'll have to find out when it happens. I guess it's one of those things that when it happens, it happens. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mike. So that's cool. Tell us a little bit about an expansion, not just of uh, stars, but an expansion on the International Space Station. Yeah, so there's a chance. Uh, Bigelow Aerospace announced on uh, January 28th, or, or excuse me, on the 18th uh, through a tweet that they are in talks with NASA to possibly have an extended stay with their beam module. And with it, it's currently docked to the International Space Station. It was uh, brought up there last year in April, and then they fully expanded it in May of last year. And so far, NASA has been getting really good data from it, and they've been getting really good results from it. And so Bigelow is trying to uh, have talks with them to possibly have this, the beam module stay there for an extended period of time, maybe even permanently until the end of the uh, space station's life. And uh, with this, they also want to have uh, hosted payloads inside of the beam module, which you can see a photo there of astronauts inside, which most of the time they have the hatch closed on it, but they do periodically periodically enter the, the module, you know, to uh, check out its instruments and, and uh, take some uh, readings and things like that. But they possibly want to have, you know, I'm hoping or rather thinking that they might have some modular experiment racks and maybe even have a partnership with NanoRacks or uh, some sort of competitor to start flying experiments up there. Maybe even have like a, some sort of dedicated greenhouse and so that they don't have to have just the small greenhouse experiments in the Destiny Lab, but they could actually have bigger ones to actually have a, a, a bigger supply of fresh vegetables and maybe even fruits and whatever else they might be able to do. But that's just my ideas for what they could do with it. But it's definitely exciting. And uh, NASA has confirmed that they are in talks with them. So, so hopefully they will either get one or the other or both, you know, permission to do experiments in there, an extended stay or both. And that would, that would just be great for a commercial space and space flight in general. So yeah, it would be fantastic. Our All fingers right. crossed. That's very, very cool. So we're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back at the other side of the break, we're going to be having Dennis Wingo on to talk about going back to the moon, but right this time. So stay tuned. Tomorrow we'll return right after this break.
Hello and welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our interview with Dennis Wingo, we first want to give a huge shout out to all of our patrons of Tomorrow of the Escape Velocity variety. And of course, not only are we going to talk about our Escape Velocity patrons who give us $10 or more per episode, we're also going to talk about our Orbital patrons as well. These folks give us $5 or more per episode. Now, they get free worldwide swag store shipping and a whole bunch of other goodies like our Google Hangouts when we do them. So if you would like to help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, consider heading on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And I'm very excited today to be joined by our special guest for this episode, Dennis Wingo, who is the founder and CEO of Skycorp Incorporated. Dennis, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We really appreciate you being here. Well, thanks for having me today, and that sounds like a good deal, man. i got to go check out your crowdfunding. <laughs> yeah, it's worked out very well for us in, in the, the past and so far into the future as well. Um, now, we're talking today about a really interesting article that you wrote called Getting Going Back to the Moon Right This Time. Um, now, in that article, um, you talk about the plans beforehand, uh, SEI in 1989 and VSE in 2004, um, but you don't quite touch on the idea of the plan to go forward um, in, in our current times right now. So do you think that either of those two previous plans are a good path forward, or is there another path that you think would be a lot better than those two? Well, um, actually, and uh, I've got a new blog coming up on this subject, I do think that the 1989, uh, what was called the Report of the 90-Day Study on the Human Exploration of the Moon and Mars, provides a great beginning template for uh, the new administration's return to the moon and then on to Mars. Awesome. And uh, can you recap briefly for our viewers who may not be familiar with them, what both yeah. uh, SEI and VSE are uh, with, those, with those two separate programs? Yeah, originally uh, in July of 1989, President Bush Sr. came out with a, uh, a new plan to return to the moon and on to Mars as uh, part of, I guess that was the 30th anniversary uh, of the uh, lunar landing. And it was actually a pretty great plan. Uh, it involved the space shuttle at the time and building a space station that would be an in-orbit transportation hub going to the moon, and then a, let's call it a quasi-heavy lift launch vehicle that could put 70 tons, and then an advanced launch vehicle that could put 90 tons into orbit that would enable us to build, let's call it a cis lunar transportation system uh, that would allow us to get first to the moon and then on to Mars. Um, and there were four reference architectures for the SEI, as it eventually was called. Uh, most of them had in situ resource utilization, oxygen production on the moon. Uh, it, was, it was actually quite comprehensive and quite, um, let's call it, uh, geared toward more the technical engineering uh, things that you had to do to actually open up the solar system. Um, the VSE, as it was called, uh, the Vision for Space Exploration, was announced in February of 2004 by George W. Bush, um, the son of H.W., in his uh, before the uh, election that year. And it was a also supposed to be a template for a vision, and vision means sense of purpose for going to the moon and then on to Mars. At that time, there was no specific architecture called, but there were a lot of studies. Uh, there were what was called the Human and Robotic uh, Studies, HNRT studies, of which uh, my company was a part of, uh, developing new technologies, uh, solar electric propulsion, and things like that to go back to the moon. Um, and then there were the what's called the CENR or the concept exploration and refinement. What was a little bit different about those is that at the time it was baseline that NASA wouldn't have enough money to build a heavy lift launch vehicle and thus we're going to see what we can do with what we have. 
that got completely changed in 2006 when uh, Sean O'Keefe, who was the NASA administrator and Bush family friend, left, and Dr. Mike Griffin took over uh, with what he called at the time Apollo on steroids. And we all know what happens to people that do steroids. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So pretty much uh, that kind of most of that fell away and we kind of have what we have now, which is kind of, let's call it the worst of all worlds in terms of um, not enough money, uh, too much hardware, and not a real purpose uh, for going to Mars. Now, uh, you mentioned that the justification for the SEI program was very weak. Um, it, some of it was noted as national pride, prestige, and inspiration were simply inadequate rationales for the new initiative when you stack them against other domestic priorities. Uh, was that all that SEI had to offer, or was there something else that it could have offered? Well, there is. It, there was a lot that it actually did offer, and that, let's call it... Uh, and, and I talk about this, um, I did a previous blog on John Loxton's book, After Apollo. There seems to have been a disconnect, uh, a very strong disconnect uh, in, in right after Apollo between the policymakers and the people that were actually doing the technical design work. Uh, the same thing was very much true with the Space Exploration Initiative in that, let's call it the, um, and we call it when we do stuff, we call it level zero requirements. Why are we doing this? And there was a disconnect, oh, we're doing it for prestige, we're doing it for this or that, but the people who were working on it had incredibly good ideas, and it was an incredibly good implementation of how to go back to the moon, develop fuel depots, and all the kind of stuff that you need to build a comprehensive uh, space exploration architecture. So, and this disconnect was the the wrong part of the disconnect, which was the rationales is what was uh, what Congress seized upon at the time to actually defund the space exploration initiative. And so, uh, and then as you see in my blog, it was a little different with the VSE. The top level guys had it 100 percent right. John Marburger. Uh, O'Keefe, uh, Steidel, they really, really got the why, but the implementation was very weak. Mm. Now, um, you were quoted earlier in your, your career as saying there's no reason for going to Mars without helping the environment on Earth and building infrastructure that will supply raw materials for industry. Do you still, I mean, that was really forward thinking for as early as your career was. Um, do you still think that that's true today? Yeah, that was, uh, at the time, that was part of a, let's call it a, my first student epic rant uh, <laughs> at, at the folks at that time. And I, I still believe that 100%. And uh, this is what we're going to be continuing to work on this year in writing. Uh, we have between one to three books that we're going to come out with this year. And that area is that, uh, let's just take one area mining is the most polluting thing we do on the earth and we have uh, worse and worse resources in terms of their richness and so you got to dig more dirt to get every gram of platinum or every gram of gold or whatever you want and we we know more and more every single day about the resources that we have in the solar system so if we can shift some of that we'll reduce the environmental burden on the earth while at the same time vastly increasing our resource base. So this will help to remove a major, major uh, uh, source of pollution for the whole planet. And that was really what I was talking about at the time. But, you know, let's just say it was more uh, my, my first shot over the bow. And now I know a little bit more. Now, um, many of the failures in carrying out plans post-Apollo uh, moon shot stem from economic troubles or political instability. And what are some of the ways that long-term goals can be stabilized and not just, you know, scrubbed with the next incoming administration? Is it possible to design a program that can withstand change? Yeah, it is. And I'm going to go back. And if you look at some of my previous blogs, uh, I go through the economics, I go through the federal budget, 
Uh, when NASA was cut, let's just say between uh, fiscal year 1966 and 1970, NASA had a 50 percent budget cut at the same time that the federal budget was increasing by a hundred billion dollars a year. So it was real, even though the deficit was used as an excuse both in the late 1960s and the early 1990s, federal spending as a whole increased dramatically during both of those periods. So at the end of the day, it was a question of priorities and political power versus the, the actual uh, amount of money that we were going to spend. Uh, Paul Spudis, my fellow uh, lunatic, ha has a <laughs> very, very sage observation that, uh, and he was talking about this at the beginning of the VSC, is that NASA has adequate money uh, to go back to the moon and even to do Mars if it is wisely deployed. And um, at the time, during the SCI, the big thing was, oh, my God, it's going to cost $400 billion. We have a deficit. We have all these other priorities. Don't do it. But if you look at the things that the SCI, Space Exploration Initiative, were going to develop, a space station and a heavy lift launch vehicle. Guess what, friends and neighbors? We have both of those now. And so it should be a question of implementation and if we do the implementation right, I, I firmly and strongly believe that we can do it within the existing NASA budget. And I, and I think Paul was right on the money with that observation. So at this time, if we can marry uh, vision and implementation together, I think we have a fantastic uh, opportunity here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to talk a little bit about um, the implementation, you suggest that the mission statement from the uh, Vision for Space Exploration program was smart in order to compete for the budget. And it said uh, the fundamental goal of this vision is to advance U.S. scientific, security, and economic interests through a robust space exploration program. And does that still hold true? Or in today's economy, does the level of global cooperation in space that we enjoyed through partnerships on, say, the International Space Station, and even ESA offered the promise of something that we can't achieve or afford on our own? Well, again, I want to go can't afford on our own. Just since 2008, the federal budget has increased by a trillion dollars a year. So again, I, I'm going to uh, contend that it's not money, it's priority. And then when you look at, um, if you look at the amount of money that NASA gets and then the interest of people such as the group that was assembled at Draper Fisher Jurvetson, um, uh, the venture capital firm in 2014, uh, I think through public-private partnerships and people who are interested in doing it and Elon wanting to do it privately I think we we are now truly at a stage to where we can go back to uh, something that in 1960 the president or CEO of General Electric, uh, Frank, uh, Ralph Cordner, said was the, the natural evolution, which is the economic development of the solar system. And that really should not be 100% government driven. Uh, because, uh, again, the government is never going to allocate re resources as efficiently as a private sector will. Mm. Yeah, and just to kind of go into that uh, a little bit, uh, one of our chat room members, Branch Predictor, uh, is asking, do you think SpaceX can come up with a good implementation of ideas like this? Well, Elon has his goal. He has what he wants to do. And I have a lot of confidence that Elon, at the end of the day, uh, will be able to do what he wants to do. So I think the, the, the best way to do it is to kind of uh, coordinate interest. You know, what does NASA really want to do? They want to put scientists on the moon and Mars to study the moon and Mars. Okay, if Elon comes along and says, hey, guys, I'll do it for one-tenth of what uh, you're currently paying to do. Uh, you might not, you'd still might want to let NASA do it their way, but at the same time in parallel, let Elon do his. And we have our own ideas for uh, implementing lunar architectures because Elon's not real interested in the moon. And so I think there is, with proper incentives, and this is where I go to the concept of zero-G, zero-tax, 
which was uh, passed Congress in the year 2000, which would remove all taxation for companies that want to do stuff like this, I think we, we actually are on the cusp of a brilliant new age of exploration and the economic development of the solar system. Now, uh, do you feel that it's an American goal to go back to the moon and continue to Mars, or is it a goal of humanity to do that? Well, the solar system is big enough for everybody. <laughs> um, and, and, and I really do think that it is a value for everybody in the world, India, China, Europe, Russia, um, any of these folks to do it. I, I do, you know, you know, I'm a football fan, uh, and I root for the Alabama Crimson Tide. And just like I root for the Alabama Crimson Tide, I'm going to root for my country, uh, but I do think there's plenty of room for us to do it together and to do and to cooperate. And just like we cooperate uh, with ships on the ocean, um, we can do and planes in the sky. Uh, there, there's plenty of room out there and plenty of resources for everyone. So, what do you think the attraction is? The heavy. I have a visitor. Oh yes, look at that. There's your. <laughs> This is James Tiberius Kirk. Oh, by that's the way. an excellent name for a cat. And Kirk seems to be definitely enjoying the perch on your shoulder there. So I think that may be one of our first cats we've had as a guest uh, on the show. So pretty good, uh, pretty good cat <laughs> for you there. Um, now, what are your thoughts about the European Space Agency's Lunar Village idea? This is actually a question um, from our chat room from Lars von Braun. What, what do you think about that and their idea? I think it's very interesting. Uh, I've had discussions with some of the folks involved, and uh, I, I think it's a great idea. And there's an old Chinese uh, saying, let a thousand flowers bloom. And I think there's a lot of merit with us cooperating with them and, and doing things. And uh, I, uh, I actually expect to have some involvement in this. Uh, effort with the uh, Lunar Village. I know Bernard Foyne and those guys and uh, their heart's in the right place and I wish them the best of luck. Excellent. Well, um, what do you make of the current administration's intentions uh, in regards to space? And do you have any recommendations for them? I think it's exceptionally interesting. Uh, we uh, and, and nobody knows this for 100% because you never know what's going on in politics and the machinations. But it looks like highly um, probable that uh, uh, Congressman Brendan Steen is going to be the new administrator. And, of course, he's brilliant because he gave me and Paul Spudis a personal shout-out <laughs> at LEAG in December. So, obviously, he's the smartest guy around. Uh, so... Uh, I, I do see a pivot to the moon. Um, I saw in a newsletter from Newt Gingrich the other night that it is his advice to the new administration to push public-private partnerships, which is along the lines that we've been talking about. And um, I, I, I can't say anything specifics, but I do know there is an intense interest in the moon and the, the folks that I know that are associated with the new administration – uh, I do think that will be the focus, and frankly, I think it's the appropriate focus because I, you know, you just see from the news reports that the new administration is going to be very focused on debt reduction. So I don't see a whole lot of big increases for NASA, and through public-private partnerships and a more efficient allocation of uh, existing NASA resources, I think we're going to do just fine. And is there anything that we as fans of human space exploration can do to help gain traction to these ideas of returning to the moon and Mars? Well, yeah. Um, and, and, I mean, this is along the lines of what I've been doing for literally, I don't know, past almost 30 years now since I got into the space business. Learn. What are you interested in? Are you interested in 3D printing? Think about 3D printing on the moon, how that would roll out. Do you have ideas? Uh, uh, there's room enough in this for everyone. And I think, uh, and I encourage the young people who come by our um, Lunar Orbiter uh, Image Recovery Project uh, there at NASA Ames is to go out and learn what are you interested in? Do you want to help save the future? I truly believe that the economic development of the solar system and the acquisition of the resources of the solar system 
will help to build a prosperous global civilization where everyone can be prosperous. And thus, there is just so much room for everyone who wants to see a positive future to make their contributions. So, Dennis, where can people go to find out more about you? Well, uh, basically, my WordPress blog um, at uh, denniswingo.wordpress.com is where my current thoughts are. Um, we have on Facebook our Lunar Orbiter Continues page, and uh, I haven't updated my Skycorp webpage in a while, which we're going to be doing soon. But this year, we're currently in development. Um, there's going to be a Lunar Orbiter uh, book. Uh, a, a nice picture book about all of our lunar images that will be coming out in a few months. Um, we're looking to do one or two books on lunar architectures, and we hope to have those out in the next three or four months. Uh, we're looking to do some crowdfunding ourselves to help support our lunar research. Um, and so, you know, follow me on Twitter at uh, WingoD. Uh, on Twitter to see what I'm doing on a daily basis. And um, I, I'm really looking forward to the next few years here. I, I just think we're on the cusp of being able to do some amazing things. And, that's, and just keep in touch. Follow me on Twitter. Um, and let's have some fun. Yeah, and I especially do enjoy uh, your Twitter feed with all the updates that you have on it, and of course uh, the cats coming onto your Twitter feed as well. There, well, I so love my kitties. yeah, they're not just they're not just here on the show; they're also on your Twitter feed as well. So, Dennis, yeah. um, just to wrap it up, we've got some general questions that we ask all sure. of our guests who come on um, the show. And our first question, I think we already know where you're going to go with this first question, but we, we're just going to go ahead and ask it anyhow: Moon or Mars first? All of the above. All of the uh, above. I, it, it, it's not, you know, Bob Zubrin and I are great friends. And I understand and agree with Bob's proposition for Mars and, and Elon's. Elon is, is, let's call him a, an acolyte of Bob. Uh, but it is my position that we cannot sustainably colonize, explore and colonize Mars without the industrialization of the moon. They're not mutually exclusive. And the resources of the inner solar system are also going to play an amazingly important role in increasing the resource base of our of humanity. So uh, I, I don't see it as an either-or proposition. Mm. Would you go to space? Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, when do you think humans will first land on Mars? Interesting question. Uh, I, you know, it, it's very difficult um, to predict something like that. We've been predicting it, you know, 20 years in the future for the past 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> I think with the proper incentives, and I think the next year or two in that regard is going to be crucial. Uh, I do think that um, uh, hopefully with no real big global crises happening. I do see it. Uh, I actually see Elon getting there before 2030. So this is kind of the time frame that I would put on it. And uh, when do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? Depending on what happens this year, I think we could be back there as early as 2020. Uh, wow. Absolutely. Because again, we have all of the crucial essential elements from the original space exploration initiative in place. We have a heavy lift launch vehicle that will launch this year or next, the uh, SLS. We have the, the Falcon 9. We have the Falcon Heavy. We have the space station. And I think that e even a moderately intelligently implemented architecture uh, within the confines of the NASA budget and or uh, private interests, we could be we could be on the moon before the end of 2020. Oh. And uh, final question for you, Dennis: Why space? Um, why crawl out of the cave? <laughs> why climb out, climb down from the tree? I mean, it, it is um, to build a prosperous society. 
of as many people as we have on the earth. And in the year 2050, we'll have 9 billion people plus on the earth. That's not that far away. That's 33 years. We need those resources of the solar system to keep us from having to pillage our own planet in order to do it. Uh, technologies, in energy, industry, all of these things push us inevitably to move out first into the solar system and then, I believe, to the stars. Excellent. Well, Dennis, thank you so much for coming on today and talking about your blog post, getting going back to the moon right this time. It's fantastic hearing from you and hearing your answers. And thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks a bunch. And send me your, uh, the feed for this uh, when you archive it, and I'll tweet her out. We sure will. All right, Dennis, thank you so much. And we are going to go ahead and head to break. And when we come back after the break, comments from you. Excellent. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. and we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize a vision of this. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back after that fantastic interview. We're going to be going into our comments from last week's show. But before we do that, we first want to get in and thank all of our patrons of tomorrow. Once again, mentioning our Escape Velocity members who give us $10 or more and our Orbital members as well who give us $5 up to $9.99. But we also have our suborbital members. Now these folks give us $2.50 up to $4.99 per episode and they get early access to After Dark and the show once we get it up. And then we've got our ground support members who give us $1 or more. They get their name in the show and access to our Google Hangouts. So try to find yourself there. Circle yourself with a Sharpie. Oops, maybe not a Sharpie, but circle yourself. Um, somehow there. And if you'd like to help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. So we're going to go straight into the comments. I get to play Capcom today, and uh, this should be very interesting um, since I've never played Capcom before. But the previous <laughs> show's topic was about ISU, the International Space University, where we had our very own uh, Lisa on with Carrie Ann to talk about that. And let's just go ahead and get straight into the comments with our first comment coming off of YouTube from a member. Hopefully I don't screw up this name too badly here. Polkov Nicknades. Did I get that right? Polkov Nicknades? Uh, something like that. Okay, close, <laughs> we'll call that close enough. That's a tough one. Now, on the topic of spending the night as part of the Lunar X Prize, it should be noted that Lunar Night lasts about two weeks as opposed to the 12-hour nights that us Earthlings are used to, which I reckon makes it more impressive. 
And yes, Absolutely. yeah, it does. To engineer a vehicle to survive lunar night is a, a little difficult in order to uh, do that. Because not only do you have to deal with the fact that you're not going to be receiving power for two weeks, you have to expend power because your vehicle is going to get cold on the surface as well. So very mm -hmm. cool stuff with that there. Uh oh, now this one also comes from YouTube from Marnix Jansen. Space Mike, I'm sorry, but you are wrong about the get ahead tasks. They were explained fully in the press conference before the first spacewalk and were shown live. Routing cables in the rat's nest, replacing a broken camera, stowing covers for the PMA that were stowed in the airlock outside the station, and a few more. Space You're Mike. absolutely right, Marnix. You're <laughs> absolutely right. And I have to apologize. Uh, the information that I uh, wanted to get for this of getting the facts straight was from their press release, which didn't mention what those tasks were. And I did watch, you know, a, a good chunk of the, the, the footage, uh, although I didn't watch it live. But uh, I didn't watch the whole thing, and I didn't watch the entire press conference. So I apologize for all of that. I should have done uh, my homework a little bit better. And uh, that's very interesting to know that that's what they uh, were uh, uh, able to do. And especially, I wonder, I'm wondering if it's the same broken camera that the uh, they were having problems with, uh, I believe it was with uh, one of the Earthcast mm. cameras that we were having problems. So, um, but yeah, that's that's good to know. So I apologize for that, and I will do my best to do my homework better in the future. No harm, no foul. It, it happens to everybody. I know that I've I've got my own coming at the end of the comment section here. So um, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Now our next comment comes from YouTube from Philip. Matson. Now Philip says, in regards to the comment concerning going over your planned time slots, interviews and whatnot, bless you. I feel people miss out on the content of a subject due to flashcard interviews and tight time constraints. Since being a YouTube entity, you can nearly run your own clocks, as you should. You are trying to gain knowledge from these people and doing a damn fine job at it. Take all the time you need. Thanks for sharing it. And yep, awesome. that's how I feel today. Okay. Going with our interview should take as much yeah. time as we need to. So pretty cool yeah. stuff there. Even if we start late. Even if we start late, like we <laughs> did today. And boy, did we that. start quite late today. But it's okay. We're doing the show. The, the people yeah. who watch this on YouTube archive don't even know what we're talking about at the moment. But that's okay. <laughs> you guys, we're well, still I glad mean, you're watching. Just like Ben says, though, as long as the content uh, the content dictates it, you know, and yes. you know, we're having, you know, when we have these really interesting discussions and everything like that, you know, I feel the same way. I have no problem going over whatever you know self imposed time restraints that we try to have. You know, the goal is to be a one hour show, but you know, if we have if we're talking about something interesting, you know, we should we should just go ahead and go over our own our own limit there. Yes. So I agree completely. <laughs> All right, and now going on to our next comment, also from YouTube. Wow, YouTube's really getting it in this week. Uh, from, uh, oh my gosh, this one's just a combination of letters. Um, Dishik disk. Dishik disk. Uh, I have not, uh, D H C H K D S K. Uh, if you want to leave a comment telling us how we should pronounce that, uh, have at it. I'll be more than happy to give it a shot again next week. Uh, so it says, Go Lisa. It would be awesome to watch a flight to Mars and even knowing someone on it. So I think that maybe, is that in reference to Lisa's space pod that she did this week? Um, which was talking about the upcoming simulated Mars mission that I believe actually just began. No, I, I, um, I'm not sure week. if you watched the uh, the uh, previous episode, but she said that she wanted she absolutely wanted to go there. She wanted oh. to uh, retire and, and die on Mars. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's one way to go about it. I know I'm not one of those people, but... Uh, very, very interesting uh, with Lisa there. So there you go. Lisa, looks like someone a... is willing to support you. Maybe they'll crowdfund you on the way. Uh, Patreon.com slash Lisa to Mars or something like that. So very, I'll, very I'll cool. I'll be one of your Escape Velocity members, Lisa, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll be one too. So to help yeah, you just, get I mean, to whether, whether it be Lisa or anyone else, just anyone that you know or any sort of celebrity status that you might have some sort of uh, um, you know relationship with, uh, it would be super interesting to watch that journey you know and mm -hmm. kind of have that whole human perspective on it and 
you know, I'm sure with the different astronauts uh, and cosmonauts and ty hopefully taikonauts that will be involved with stuff like that, you know, I'm sure there will be particular people that all of us will, you know, kind of latch on to and relate to more than more than others. And yeah, it, when would, when this becomes a reality, which I am fully confident it will be, it'll be really interesting to see those kind of human stories when it happens. Yeah, very, very cool. All right. And our final comment comes from Thumb Westcott from Patreon. It says, dark energy, dark matter. Like I tell my third graders who just discovered infinity, it's not a real thing. It just means that if you think that's the answer, there was something wrong with your question. Ooh, shots fired at me. Um, have a little <laughs> bit of that there. I will say that my upcoming space pod for this week is about dark matter. I'm not going to talk about dark energy because that's just... Pff, that's some mind-blowing kind of stuff. Uh, but dark matter is a little bit more of a, a simple-to-understand concept than dark energy is. Um, and I will tell you something. I'm a, I will humble myself a little bit in the space pod. Um, I, I will not be as evangelical about, uh, uh, preachy about dark matter, if you will. Um, and we're going to take, it's a very good, solid look at it. And researching it, I think I am going to have to eat a little bit of humble pie, but that's okay because pie is my favorite dessert so um it's okay it, it like you know it happens to the best of us right you can't, tom, i can't help it <laughs> tom, tom actually explains himself a little bit more on a reddit post in our tomorrow yes. uh subreddit so yeah and tom i did read that post and it was a fantastic post as well um so yeah on our um on our Reddit, if you go to uh, uh, reddit.com slash r slash tmro, uh, you can read his Wall of Text for Jared, I think is the title uh, of that. And I'm, I'm very appreciative um, that someone would put a wall of text up for me to listen to. So, um, yeah, so pretty cool stuff. Now, next week, we are going to have Jim Adams, who is the former deputy chief technologist of NASA, who is now retired. We're going to have him on to talk. And in addition to that, Ben and Carrie Ann will be back from vacation. So that means that if there's something wrong, it can get fixed i don't i don't oh, know man. what that means other than we're if, gonna need to clean up after the party yeah we are mom and we can't let mom and dad know that we've ruined the house a little bit here so um, <laughs> yeah that's why we're that's what we do have cups today but it wasn't necessarily cups beforehand it was well i won't go there so um we'll just keep it like that so <laughs> so we want to thank you for watching tomorrow and hope that you enjoy your week between next episodes and hey We'll see you next week.